Justin Graham, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you, John. It's uh, great to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Oakland, California. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about adopting lean principles and agile thinking and how that can help organizations help us as we are leading our teams and to help our organizations be successful. As we get started, I wanted to share Justin's bio with everybody. Justin Graham is a chief medical officer with over 20 years experience leading clinical direction and implementation solutions that improve how patients interact with healthcare systems. He is passionate about creating digital tools and new delivery models that reduce inefficiencies, improve quality, and achieve better outcomes. As a recognized expert in product strategies and scrappy creativity, he designs and delivers early stage digital, digital health projects from idea to execution. He builds and leads high-performing teams and clinical activities with budgets of up to $40 million dollars what a tremendous background. I always love it when I, I get to have these conversations with leaders from a variety of different industries and, uh, I, you may be my first chief medical officer that I've interviewed. So this is a pleasure. Uh, anything else you would like to share with me or my listeners by way of your background before we dive on in? Uh, just that uh, it's a thrill to be here. Uh, I don't get often get to talk to people who are focused on leadership. And uh, so that's, that's a, it's a treat for me as well. And uh, I, yeah, I'm excited to talk more about my background and how I've brought lean thinking into everything I do. Yeah, cool. And I think by now, lean and agile are th are terms that people have heard a lot. You know, you go back in time 10 years and maybe that was not as common. Now, I think most people hear it a lot. I'm not so sure people actually know really what it means, though. Um, so maybe we can start there and you can define for us what you mean by lean and agile. And then we can start to talk about what that means in the healthcare space and what you've done with your teams and your organization. Yeah, of course. So um, there's a long history to lean and and the whole lean movement and agile goes way back um to toyota production systems in the uh, you can go back to i think the 50s 60s and 70s but uh, you know sort of made, became more mature in the 80s uh, and, and john let me just preface this by saying i am by no means a lean expert uh, there are many people who are just immersed in the world of agile and lean who could walk circles around me so this is just a a taste of uh, a taste of the background of this movement for your listeners to then go off and learn more and to to pique their interest. But I don't want to misrepresent myself as the world's best, biggest lean expert, but I've been a student of it for yeah. well over a decade and have tried to incorporate some of the principles into my career, into my life. It, the origination, as I said, was in manufacturing and in, in Toyota production systems where they had a completely uh, innovative approach to how to... Uh, large projects where they thought about more about self-organizing teams, relentless focus on the customer, elimination of waste, um, and, uh, um, uh, and, and trying to, uh, and, and empowering the, the worker and the folks on the, essentially on the factory floor to be able to make decisions and pull the end on cord, as they say, to stop production line. Uh, the famous, uh, anecdote is that uh if you know if you pulled the stop cord on the ford production line it was ford versus toyota at that time uh because you thought there was a problem with the assembly line you, you get docked on your pay because it, they thought that you'd never make your quota if you pulled the the stop cord the and on cord and toyota production line because you found a defect you were celebrated because you stopped a whole bunch of uh, faulty uh, vehicles from getting out to the public and so it was a completely different mindset uh many years later this was a uh, 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 merged with a variety of other uh, thinkers, thinkings for you know, uh, Donna Bedian and others uh, to uh, and, and brought together what's called the Agile Manifesto. This is a group of uh, software engineers and and people who thought about work in sort of the knowledge economy coming together, coming up with a series of principles involved with uh, that could bring Agile and sort of Agile, what they call now called Agile thinking, which is bringing lean thinking into more of the software world. And from there, there's been this uh, it's almost like a tree that's branched out about multiple different ways to bring this kind of thinking through different processes into uh, organizations. And in some cases, it's uh, pure lean. In some places, it's uh, using tools like Kanban, uh, the Scrum methodology that so many programmers use and so many product developers use comes from this as well. Um, and... Uh, 
as well as other sort of more unique niche methodologies like extreme programming. So um, that's that's the sort of the the, br the brief overview. There's a lot more available on the web if people want to really dig into the details. But that's the uh, that's the genesis. Yeah, thank you. It's it's helpful, I think, to just have a, a, a common shared understanding of where we're starting the conversation from. And like I said, I think a lot of people use the terms but don't necessarily really know what they're talking about. And not, I, I'm not one to be like, a, I don't want to get caught up in semantics and I don't want to like be arguing terminology or anything like that with anybody because um, I think that's not productive. Um, but it is just helpful to know where we're starting from. So as we talk about adopting lean principles and agile thinking uh, within our teams, within our organizations, uh, what like what's the most common way that's played out for you over the last decade as you've um, been in your positions of influence as you're trying to deliver great products to yeah. the market? Yeah, well, I'll tell you about my personal epiphany as a leader in this area when I began to start to think differently. This was when I was helping lead a um, health system here. Uh, it was on the leadership team for managing the information technology projects for uh, you know clinical use at this health system is the role of chief medical information officer. And uh, I come from previous roles. I've been in consulting and I set up you know, I felt like our projects weren't going as well as they could, uh, our IT projects. And so I set up a project management office, which is so common everywhere, and brought in some certified project managers who did what they are trained to do for big projects, which is set up a big uh, plan and a what's called a waterfall chart, you know, where you watch the look at the chart, there's bars on the chart and we start today here in August and, and, you know, that means on October one, we have to start, you know, phase one of the project. And uh, on December one, we'll hire the next person. And on January one, we'll be launching live. And, you know, the typical chart also called a Janet chart where we just can predict out the future with exact pre precision of exactly how this project is going to go and exactly how we're going to uh, work on things. And this was, these were projects where there was an awful lot of uncertainty, things we had never done before, uh, you know, uh, working with physicians who were, you know, sort of ambivalent about implementing some of this technology, uh, working with a health system that had a lot of other priorities. And what I found after banging my head against the wall with this project management team for, for some period of time was that we never once finished a project on time, on, on our schedule. And we never once failed to have to make uh, changes in the middle. And we often uh, got to the end, not even um, anywhere close to what we had predicted. And we had spent a lot of time predicting. At the same time, I was reading a book called The Lean Startup, and I was starting to get trained in you know, uh, lean Toyota methodology. And I, it, 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 I had this epiphany one day, which is that this is a very completely faulty way of looking at how to do work. And the reality, the, the great reality I've come to and that I will tell everybody is that when you try something, particularly something new, something that has a lot of risk associated with it, something that has a lot of uncertainty associated with it, your chances of getting it right on the first try are almost zero, very low. Every single project we tried out that project management office hit walls, hit unexpected barriers, changes of priority every single time. Yet we kept going back to building the waterfall chart and the Gantt chart for the next one. And, and it, it doesn't matter how brilliant you are, <laughs> how brilliant your team is. That, yeah, that that is a really important point. It It's almost zero. You could get super lucky, like winning the lottery, but you're going to have to go through iterations. That's almost always the way it's going to work, right? A absolutely, absolutely. And um, the... Uh, it wasn't, we had a phenomenal team. This is in no way uh, uh, talking about the team or, or the organization. This is just the reality. And I want to ask your listeners to just think about the last time they had a project that they tried to map out in excruciating detail and try to address every contingency before they got started and spent, you know, trying to get aim for perfect. How often those that worked out exactly according to plan doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so it requires a new kind of thinking that at the outset 
you assume failure is a necessary step on the way to success. And this is can be very hard for people to internalize, but you need to recognize that the best way to hit the home run is to have multiple at-bats and assume that you're not going to hit the home run at the first at-bat. Okay, to use a baseball metaphor, if anybody out there still watches or listens to baseball. So the, the way to do that is, and this is inherent in the agile you know, approach, which is repeated iterations and learning from every iteration and define, so we, I talk about failure, but really you have to define success as learning, as knowledge, that in, so that your next, next success, your next attempt is closer and closer to being the right attempt. And if you assume that you're going to fail at the outset of what you're going to do, but you, if you fail quickly and if you fail with low risk, you'll get another chance. And if you can really lower the, the risk and really lower the consequences of failure, you might get 20 chances or 30 chances. And then by the time you're done, you'll have been able to evolve from where you started you make, where you picked a reasonable starting place, you'll be able to evolve your way to something that is looks really, really close to what it needs to be. The, the advantage to this mindset is that you can take any change in scope, you can take on any change in circumstance, you can take on any difficult encounter anywhere where your assumptions are wrong, and you can make changes and pivot along the way and assume that you were going to get it wrong anyway. It's incredibly powerful and incredibly liberating to adopt that methodology. And as a result, you will spend far less time obsessing over planning the perfect and far more time learning about which way to go uh, based on your assumptions that could be right or wrong. So later on, when I was leading an innovation team that was building new products, we took this completely to heart. And uh, uh, this was our... This is our, the methodology we lived. And when we were building some new products, um, this is, I was chief innovation officer for the Hearst Health Companies, and we were building products for them. Our team, because this culturally was the, was the approach of our team, when we all had, we had great people who were very passionate about how to build a particular product. We were building a new product for health systems. I don't wanna go into the specifics of it, but we're building a new product for health systems. And um, we had, each team member of the team had some very unique ideas about exactly what would be the best way to build this feature and how it should, how it should perform. And we had some knockdown, drag out, you know, uh, conversations. It, you know, we all we all got along great, but it wasn't it wasn't uh, not professional. But we would really really hash it out and passionately defend one way or the other, and reached a decision point. And I just told the team, doesn't matter, just pick one, flip a coin, because it doesn't matter because both are wrong doesn't you may all think you're right you're both of them are wrong in some way we just don't know what part of them are wrong let's build a way to test so that if we're wrong we can come back here very quickly a week two weeks and just change and do the other one or try some variation because it's probably wrong anyway so why spend all our time deciding who's right so we in, we then invested our time in thinking it was building out some complex technology it was using natural language processing to to look at medical records, that was part of it. And the technology was gonna be challenging to build. The technology piece of it was gonna take um, months and months to build, but we really wanna get these answers about how the users were gonna think about the product in just a few weeks. So we, uh, this was inherent in our methodology. We decided to do what's called a, uh, a um, Wizard of Oz experiment, where we presented the end users with a finished product that read their um, documentation and gave them feedback in, in different forms, uh, like the team was talking about. Now, what they didn't know is like the Wizard of Oz, there was a, a man behind the curtain. Uh, in, in this case, it was a nurse behind the curtain who was pretending to be the computer and answering questions as if as if the computer was understanding what they were talking about. The technology, that was not the future product. The future product was gonna be machine learning, natural language processing, but we couldn't wait six months to get the technology right to figure out if the user was gonna use it the way we thought it, they would. So. We created that environment and then we could every day, every week change how it works because we would just tell the, the, the nurse behind the scenes, well, instead of doing X, do Y. 
uh, tomorrow, do it differently and we'll get see how the feedback is. And that gave us a, a framework in which to fail repeatedly. And we did fail repeatedly until we finally found something that really clicked and that would uh, be used by the end user. So just an example of how bringing that yeah. mindset into what you do changes your entire approach. Yeah, it, and it really is a shift in mindset because like you were talking about in the car example earlier, on the one hand, you're, you're viewing quote unquote failure um, you know, as something to be avoided. On the other hand, you just view it as learning. Like now we've learned one new way of how to refine our ideas to do it better the next time, right? And if you can create a psychologically safe place, uh, uh, an environment where people can share their ideas and then you can fall forward, fail fast, iterate rapidly uh, so that it's all couched in in the framing of learning and experimentation, you know, then then we're just we're just playing, right? Where it's the scientific method. We're just hypothesizing, we're testing, we're seeing what works, what doesn't work. Uh, and it's it's fun and it's 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 exciting and it's lower stakes. That's yeah. the other thing. I mean, you've referred to this a couple of times already, but I'll just put a fine point on it. If you can lower the stakes in your various iterations because they're more yeah. rapid, there's less resources that have gone into them, um, then people are going to be much more willing and able to to chase really cool, innovative ideas. Uh, when the stakes are so high, it, it, it's harder to pull that trigger and say, okay, now we're gonna go chase this thing. Um, when the, like you said, like the chances of of getting it right the first time are almost zero yeah. and the stakes are so high and it's gonna be so expensive. Of course, a lot of times you're not gonna end up chasing those ideas, right? So if we can lower the stakes, iterate faster, it's gonna make a big, big difference in the innovation in our company. That, that you're so right. If if the just imagine if the cost of failure was zero, you could fail and it would have no effect. No one would notice. No one would care. Wouldn't cost any money. Would cost barely any time. You try a million different things and see which one stuck. And then the ones that stuck, you spend more time on and do over and over again. But if you put all your eggs in one basket, if you have to do it perfect the first time out, boy, you better <laughs> you better hope the world doesn't change and the world changes every minute, every day. Uh, so it's, it's really, um, I mean, it's really intuitive once you step back and sort of get yourself out of the mindset that we've all, that we've all been in, or many people have been in forever. You start to yeah. think about all of your history and you, you touched on something that really appealed to me, uh, when I started to learn about this, which is that it, it adopts the scientific method. And I'm, I'm a physician I'm trained as a scientist. I've trained in, in, in science and this idea that you have a hypothesis and then you come up with an experiment to test your hypothesis. And then based on the experiment, you have learning and you, you either adapt your hypothesis or change it or try, and then try a new experiment to test your hypothesis. This is the scientific method. And now this approach that I'm talking about here is the scientific method applied to new products, to projects, to the business world. And once, I, once that clicked in my head, there was no going back. There was no going back. Yeah, excellent. And you just brought up a really good point. So let's say we're lucky if we're not doing this kind of a lower stakes, fast iteration, lean and agile approach. Um, let's say we get lucky, we hit the lottery, right? That one in a million idea, it works the first time. Um, that's amazing. Like if that works, good for you. Um, let's say that happens. The reality is we live in a rapidly changing world. So just because you, you, you like win the lottery in that moment, like a year from now, it may not be relevant anymore. So what are the chances of you hitting the lottery a second time? <laughs> I sure, I mean, it's it's just, it's it's silly. You know, when we put it in those terms, it's silly. Yet that's what so many organizations have done. Um, you know, uh, mature organizations all the way down to kind of new lean uh, uh, entrepreneurial startups. Uh, that's what so many often do. And it really is absurd. And, and I get it. People are passionate about their ideas. They believe in their ideas. But what you said to your team saying, it doesn't matter. Let's just choose one and do it and then figure out what parts work and what parts don't work. That's hard to the ego, right? Especially if you have someone who's, you know, a new tech startup or something and they they believe in their their algorithm, they believe in their their new whatever. Uh, man, that's that's a hard thing, you know, for them to to sacrifice, be willing to sacrifice their baby, their intellectual property, whatever, to say, oh, maybe this isn't the end all be all, the answer to everything, and I'm going to have to iterate. Uh, that's a, that's a hard pill to swallow yeah. for people, uh, and and requires some intellectual humility. 
Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Uh, it's it's a mindset you have to go into, particularly if you do something like a startup where you really don't know what you don't know. So it's, I think, I which is not to say you shouldn't have a, a strong vision and a mission. Like those things don't need to change your vision for what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish in the big picture. But as you get closer and closer to te the tactical and the, the nuts and bolts of what you're doing, you have to assume that at least at the outset, you've got many things wrong and you're going to have to probably make the change. Uh, which is not to say your vision should change all the time. Vis you know, vision is a different different beast. You need to have an idea of where you want to go in the world. You need to know which way you want to point the, point the, point the ship. Uh, but it's possible the ship may have to go through the around the whirlpool or through the rocks or uh portage over land or whatever you just don't know exactly the way to get that what's between you and that destination so you can't just always assume maybe you don't need a ship maybe you need an aircraft so you may need to change your way to get there but uh, you know your 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 vision shouldn't change hopefully you have a vision for how you want it, the world to be in the future but your directions and your approach may have to change many 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 times before you get there so yeah yeah well said Justin, this has just been a really fun conversation. I know at the time we're getting towards the end of our time together today, uh, but I wanted to give you a chance as we're getting, uh, wrapping up to share with listeners how they can find out more about you, your team, uh, your company, um, how they can get connected with you, and then give us the final word, the final key takeaways from our conversation for today. Yeah, of course. So, uh, so I guess, as we mentioned earlier, I'm a chief medical officer at Giant. That's G-Y-A-N-T. We are a digital health startup that makes conversational AI tools for health systems and health insurers. Uh, we might be on the web page of your health system today where you can go and get information about, um, you know, scheduling an appointment or what's going on with this rash. <laughs> I have a fever and a cough, what should I do next? And uh, I um, I can be reached if you anybody wants to reach me directly, uh, probably best to find me on LinkedIn. That's Justin V. Graham, uh, MD, and I'm easy to find, uh, uh, LinkedIn slash Justin V. Graham. And I'm happy to hear from your listeners. And uh, if anybody wants to take their own first few steps down this path and learn more, I would encourage you to uh, go out and buy The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. I would encourage you to read uh, anything you can about the Toyota production systems, read about the Agile Manifesto, and um, start thinking about the things you're doing every day that uh, aren't, that are assuming that you aren't gonna fail, uh, especially as you try new things. And try to think about how you can uh, change that mindset and the culture of those around you towards a more agile approach. I love it. Thank you, Justin. This has just been a fun conversation. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Justin and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. They can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.